and I'm sure you all know that we have an election coming up on Tuesday. Uh, I've heard some people say that it's the uh, most important election in American history. Now, I don't, being a student of American history, I don't agree with that. I do believe it is an important election, but probably not the most important election that we've ever had, maybe the most important election of our generation. And I've steered away from uh, political sermons over the past months. Uh, some people have, uh, uh, some churches have gotten really into it, and they, their pastors have preached a lot of political uh, commentaries, you might say, from the pulpit. And I, I don't want to do that this morning. I'm not going to endorse a candidate for you this morning. I'm not going to uh, preach any kind of political policy or any partisan politics. But I do want to remind you of some things this morning. See, there, there are a lot of people in our country today, maybe even some in our church, that have some anxiety over the election and who's going to win and, and, and a lot of anxiety over what's going to come after it because there is a lot of uh, uh, potential for civil unrest, for rioting and uh, people protesting and, and all the stuff that seems to come with elections these days. So there is some legitimate concern here. But in thinking about all of that, I asked myself the question this week, what would Jesus have to say about our upcoming election? What would Jesus have to say about it? And the, the more I looked into the Word of God, the more I kept coming back to the same answer to that question. What would Jesus have to say about that election? If not much. Not much. You see, Jesus himself lived during a time of uh, great political upheaval. A time really when the political divisions and the uh, uh, political persecution that was going on in the world was much greater than it is even in our, our country today. And despite the fact that Jesus lived under such harsh political times, he really only told us, pay your taxes. That was really the only comment that Jesus had to have about and say about, about civil government. But as we move forward in the New Testament, we do learn that we as Christians have a, a relationship with government, a relationship with civil authority. And as we approach this divisive election, I want to remind you of some of the things that the Bible has to say about our relationship with government. I think the best place for us to start this morning is in the book of Romans in chapter 13. Where Paul writes in verse 1, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Uh, therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we do uh, ask you to uh, lead us in God in the coming weeks and how we respond to this election and how we as Christians relate to whatever happens in the coming days and, and whoever wins. Uh, Lord, we, we just uh, we want to do what's right in your eyes. And Lord, we, we pray that you will uh, uh, choose, Lord, for us the, uh, uh, the correct people to win these elections that are coming up, Lord. And we, uh, we pray that our country will honor you in the choices that we vote for. But Lord, we know this is all in your hands. And Lord, we trust you to... Uh, to bring us through this as your people and get us through and, and bring us out on the other side of it in good shape. Lord, we, we trust in you. Our trust isn't in man. Our trust is in the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now Peter, Peter wrote to pretty much the same thing that Paul wrote in 1 Peter 2 verse 13. He says, Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man. Uh, for the Lord's sake, or whether to the king as supreme, or to governors as to those who are sent by him, uh, for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of those who do good. Uh, again, I'll, I'll say there are many people in the country today who are, have great concerns over what's going to happen after this election. Regardless of who wins or who loses, they, they have concern over political violence rising up. I even had one fellow this past week who told me, you need to go out and make sure you're stocked up on ammunition. He was serious. That's not the way we as Christians are to think, and that's not the way we as Christians are to act. Nowhere in Scripture are Christians ever called to take up arms against the government. 
Nowhere in Scripture are we called to rebel against the government or protest or march or burn buildings or, or tear up cars or do any of the things that some people are apt to do. The Bible consistently tells us that we are to submit to governmental authority. We cannot obey, disobey. We cannot disobey the authority of uh, the elected officials that God has ordained or put in place. Unless, and there is one exception, unless those governmental authorities command us to do something that is contrary to the commandments of God. You might remember there was a time when Peter and the other apostles were preaching Jesus Christ in the temple in Jerusalem, and the religious leaders of that day, the Jews, told them to stop. Stop preaching in that name. Stop preaching in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what the authority told them to do. How did Peter and the apostles respond to that in Acts 5, verse 29? Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Whenever civil authority, whenever those who are in leadership positions and rulers' positions tell us to do something that is contrary to the commandments of our Lord and God, we must disobey civil authority. I'm reminded of Daniel, and I'm reminded of uh, uh, the three uh, young men that were serving under Nebuchadnezzar in the Old Testament, and how Nebuchadnezzar kept telling them to do things that were contrary to the, uh, uh, to the will of God, and they, they kept disobeying Nebuchadnezzar, who was king, and uh, they were thrown in the lion's dens, and they were put in the fiery furnace, and all of that. So there are times when we must stand up against civil authority, against rulers, whenever they, they are commanding us to do things contrary to what God has told us to do. Now those apostles, when they, when they refused to, to obey the, the rulers in their place, did they take up arms and did they fight with them? No. They just said, no, we're not going to do it. And what was the result? They were thrown into prison. They were beaten. With rods, they were beaten and they were thrown into prison. Now, we're to, we're to respond to government in the same way. We're to disobey government only when government tells us to do something that's contrary to the will of God. But understand, the result of that might be the same. We might get thrown in jail. We might get thrown into prison. There, there might be some punishment that government would come against us with because we've disobeyed. But we cannot obey man ahead of God. We must obey God rather than men. Now, we're blessed. And I mean we are truly blessed to live in the United States of America. This is a wonderful country. And I think we lose sight of that. This is a wonderful country, and I, I'm proud to say I'm, a, I'm an American. <laughs> I am a patriot. And I, I'm not ashamed of that. We have great rights in this country. Even as fallen sometimes as it seems our nation has gotten, even as morally corrupt as sometimes we, we seem to have gotten, Despite our nation's failings and our, our nation's uh, shortcomings, we still have in this nation the right to free speech. We still have in this nation uh, the freedom and the right to worship. Now we take that for granted and I tell you it's not like that all over the world. It's not. I, I was reading just this past week about how in Afghanistan, which is now under the rule of that group that we call the Taliban, that within just this past week they passed a law in Afghanistan, get this ladies, because this is about you, in Afghanistan, no woman's voice, no woman's voice is allowed to be heard in public. None. In Afghanistan this week, no woman can speak where anyone can hear her. Their law says that even if a woman is praying in public, she must pray so lowly that no one can hear her but herself. Otherwise, she's breaking the law. In our country, we hear a lot about women's rights. We hear a lot about freedom of this and freedom of that regarding women. But ladies, you got it good in this country because it's not like this everywhere else. At least here, you can say what you want to say when you want to say it, and people can't stop you. We have the, the right in this country to worship. We have the right to believe. 
It's not like that everywhere else. I read just this morning where there was a woman in Egypt who secretly was Christian. She had been hiding it from her own husband. Her husband did not know, but he found out. And guess what? When he found out, she was already seven months pregnant. He beat her so badly that when she went to the hospital, she lost her job. And there was no crime committed there. He, didn't, he, he wasn't prosecuted. There was, there was nothing wrong with that in the country of Egypt. To beat his wife until she lost her baby because she was a Christian. In China, uh, they have pastors that, uh, there was a group of three that just released that had been in prison for 15 years because they had proclaimed the name of Jesus Christ in China. In Nigeria, people are dying by the hundreds at the hands of Muslim extremists because they're trying to establish churches there and proclaim the name of Christ. So believe me, in this country, we have a good, we have the right to speak, and we have the right to believe. And we should be glad for that. Thank God for that. That's what God has given us. It's a gift. But even here in the United States, it's not always easy to be a Christian. Civil authority, when it defies God, we must defy civil authority. But other than that, we are commanded to submit to that authority. Again, Romans 13, verse 1, let every soul be subject to the governing authority. Paul tells us why in that same verse, verse 1, he says, For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. That's hard for us to understand sometimes. God is the one who puts governmental authority in place. In all places, in all time, all authority belongs to God. God is the one who puts authority in place. He puts the people in the offices. He puts them in the place of, of, uh, of, uh, of rulership. And we are to submit to that because it is God ordained. Now there are several institutions, actually three I should say, three institutions in the Bible that God thinks is important. The first institution that God ordained in the Bible was the institution of marriage. Marriage. Back in the book of Genesis, the first uh, institution, as I might call it, was the union of one man and one woman into a, a marriage relationship. That's important to God because that institution is the bedrock of the family. The second institution that I think God feels like is important as I read Scripture is the institution of His people. In the Old Testament, that was the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, it's the church. The church is the institution of our faith. But there's a third institution that is important to God, and we read it throughout Scripture, and it's the institution of civil government, civil authority. It is an institution that has been ordained by God. God ordains government to keep the peace. God ordains government to keep social order. Without government, there is chaos. Without government, uh, there is uprising. There's no peace. Look at the few nations right now that really don't have any government working at all for them. I think about the nation of Haiti. You go down there and the whole nation of Haiti right now is uh, ruled really by the, the drug lords and the, uh, the thugs. Uh, so when there's no government in place, uh, there's chaos. But understand, whether government is good or whether government is bad, it's still God ordained. Now that's, that's really difficult for us to understand. We can see how God would have a hand in a government that's righteous, in a government that's, uh, uh, that's punishing evil and upholding what's good, but it's really difficult for us to see God whenever we see government as being unrighteous and supporting what is evil. But understand, God's in it. God's in it. God ordains government for His purposes. And sometimes He uses bad government. He put the Romans in place. He put Nebuchadnezzar in place. He puts all the presidents of the United States in place. And some of them are good. Some of them are bad. But God uses all of that for His purpose and for His glory. And we need to understand that. It's not for us to question to whoever wins the election this Tuesday. 
whether it be the person of your choice or not, understand God has allowed that person to take that office for his purposes and for his glory and eventually for our good. Now here's what God has given us, and I think it's a great gift. Whenever we as Americans are displeased with our government, God has given us the, the gift, you might say, of democracy. If you're displeased with the government and how it's working and how it's running, if you're not pleased with how things are going this past four years and you want to change, or, or if you're pleased and you want to keep things going the way they are, you have the right to vote. You have that God-given gift, and I encourage you to do so if you haven't done so. I know most of us here probably voted early, but your right to vote is a gift from God because God has given us this democracy. That's our form of government. It is God-ordained that we have a democracy in this nation, and if we don't vote, then we're, we're not operating within the plan that God has for this country. So we should get out and vote. We should vote our conscience. I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. It's not up to me. That's an individual decision. You need to vote for whoever you think is going to honor God and do the best for our country. So when you go to the polls, vote for the person that you think will do that best. And if you don't see anybody on the ballot, then you can always write in somebody you think that will. You have that right. You have that God-given gift. But understand, whatever the results, God is the one who's ordained that whatever government we receive at the end of this election. All, all government comes from God, whether it's good or bad. Now, that's, that's true of all God's institutions. Not every marriage is a good one, is it? Not every church is a good one, is it? Not every government is a good one. But God allows these things to happen. He allows them. His intent is that government will protect us. His intent is, is that government will watch over us and punish evildoers and, and do what's right for those who, who live in civil obedience, that those who are good citizens. When government fails to do what God has planned government to do, whenever government fails to protect us, whenever government fails to do what's right for those who do good and to punish those who, who do what's wrong, then we all suffer. We all feel the pain. Again, verse 1 of Romans 13, let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. I read that and I thought, well, who was it that Paul was really writing to there? Who, who did Paul write specifically to when he, when he wrote those words? And, and I understand he was writing to Christians, people like us, who were living in the city of Rome in that time. They were living under Roman government. So he was talking about there about the Roman government. Now understand the Roman government of that day was corrupt and it was evil. And Paul is telling those people, submit to that corrupt, evil government. A bad government. Now the Romans, they did some good things. They did some good things. They, uh, during Paul's lifetime, they were under what was called the Roman Pact, which was a long period of world peace. There were no major wars going on at that time. None. The reason for that was because Romans had already destroyed or conquered or enslaved everybody that could possibly rebel against them, but there was peace. They also were the ones who established road systems. If you go out to that part of the world today, even in Europe, there's still fragments left of the Roman roads. They had a great road system. And in our day, it's not the equivalent to interstates. They established a postal system so that people could communicate over long distances. They had a, a aqueduct system that would pump water into places where water had never been before. So yeah, they had some, some good things, but for the most part, they were mean. They were just flat out cruel. They were evil. They were the very ones who developed the whole idea of crucifying people as a way of execution. They used it against our Lord Jesus Christ. If you read about the lives of the Caesars during that day, the emperors of Rome, 
uh, you'll see that the majority of them were, were pedophiles, they were homosexuals, they were, they were fornicators and adulterers of all kinds. They were evil men who were power hungry and oppressive. They, they liked to step on people. They were the very ones who a short time after Paul wrote this letter would cut Paul's head from his shoulders. He died at the hands of Romans when his, he was beheaded. Yet, those are the very same people that Paul is writing to here telling these Christians to submit to. So whether government is good or whether government is bad, we as Christians are not to rebel. We are to submit Paul tells us in verse 2 there, he says, Whoever therefore resists the authority, resists the ordinance of God. If God puts government in place and God ordains it, then we resist it. Who are we resisting against? We're resisting against God. I, I read that and I, I thought about the potential we have this coming week for rioting and fighting and protesting and looting of stores and burning people. Just use it. I think that is an excuse to go into stores and steal these days, but think about all of that and, and I realize that we as Christians are not to be a part of that. We're not to have a hand in it. Now that doesn't mean that we have to support the government in everything and everything and everything and everything they do. Uh, I think about the government and I, I can honestly say over the past many years I, I have supported very little that our government has done regardless of who was in office. I, I think we've been sliding for a long time. But we as Christians should, should never be involved in, in civil war, in civil disobedience, protesting and marching and burning and fire bombing and all the stuff that people do in this day and time. We don't point our, people, our finger at people that, that voted differently than we do and call them profane names. We submit. We submit to government. That's what God's called us to do. You have the right again to, to vote your conscience this week if you haven't already done so, and I encourage you to do that. But we submit to government because government is God-ordained, but Paul says there's another reason we submit to government. In verse 2 he says, those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. People who rebel against civil authority will bring the judgment of that civil authority back on themselves. Old Testament's kind of full of... Uh, of scriptures that kind of point that same direction in Exodus 21 verse 23 the law of Moses there says if, if any harm follows then you shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth hand for hand, foot for foot burn for burn, wound for wound strike for strike that wasn't written as a, a passage for us to use for individual vengeance whenever somebody does something you do something back to them what that scripture was telling us is that it was a scripture written for the nation of Israel. It was, if, if you have a, a law enforcement, if you have a governmental body, whenever the law is broken, that there's supposed to be an equal punishment applied to the crime that was committed. That's what was written there in the law of Moses. Now there are a lot of progressives. I use that term loosely because... Whenever I hear the word progressive in my mind, I'm thinking about people that are regressive. But there are a lot of progressives out there that would like to defund law enforcement. There are some liberal judges who, who refuse to punish crimes, some liberal attorney generals who refuse to prosecute crimes. They don't want to apply a punishment equal to the crimes that we see in America today. And it causes a lot of trouble for us because those criminals, they go right out and they commit the same crimes over and over and over again because they don't live in any fear of being punished for the crimes that they commit. But that's not what Scripture tells us should happen. People are to be punished with a punishment equal to the crime that they've committed. And government's responsible for making that happen. Now, there are a lot of people that are carrying guns these days. Now, I don't want to get into gun rights. But I believe one of the reasons, and maybe the most prominent reason that a lot of people are carrying guns today is because they no longer trust the civil authority. They no longer trust the, the government to protect them. So therefore, people feel like they have to protect themselves. and They feel like they need to carry a gun. 
And that's a sad state that we should live in such fear in this country that we feel like we have to protect ourselves in that way. That's supposed to be the government's job. The government should be the one protecting us. We shouldn't have to be living in fear and worried about protecting ourselves. When government fails to enforce the law, there's an increase in crime. There's an increase in, in civil disobedience. There's an increase in, in violence. People get hurt. I think we see that even in our country today. Civil authority is refusing to punish those who commit crimes, and the problem is a rise in violence and crime. When government breaks down, society breaks down. A lot of people in this country that are living in fear because government refuses to do its job of punishing criminals for the, for the crimes that they've committed. Only evildoers should be in fear of the government. Those who are doing what's right, those who are doing what's good, should not have to live in fear. Romans 13, verse 3 says, For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. God didn't design government. God didn't design authority. God didn't design law enforcement uh, to terrorize good citizens. God designed uh, government and, and law enforcement to be a terror to those who would do evil. To put fear in the hearts of those who would do evil. If our government was doing its job then we wouldn't have to fear all the evil that's going on in the world today. Our court should be punishing criminals to the fullest degree of the law. And there should be no partiality in that. There should be no consideration, Scripture says, for, for race or financial ability or for gender or for any of the other personal reasons that people get in trouble and do the things that they do. Personal history should play no part in it. We've, we've, lost, we've lost something in our country today because I think we've forgotten what equality means. When this nation was founded and the, and the document said that, uh, that all people are created equal, I think we, we, we have redefined equality in such a way that uh, we, we've, lost, we've lost something. It, there was a time when equality meant that everybody would be treated in the same way, that everybody would be held equally responsible and equally accountable for their actions. But in America today, we've redefined equality to mean that the law is going to take into account every person's individual differences, every person's individual being. And we can't live that way because it causes division in our country. And Jesus himself said, a nation divided against itself cannot stand. In regard to law breaking, Scripture tells us that law breakers are to be punished swiftly, quickly, Ezra 7, verse 26, I think a, a great verse to point to this. It says, whoever will not observe the law of God, the law of your God, and the law of the king. So he's talking there about the moral law of God and the civil law of the nation. He says, if anybody will not observe the law, let judgment be executed speedily on him, whether it be death or punishment or confiscation of goods or imprisonment. God never intended for our court system to string out court appeals forever for people who break the law to, uh, to wait years uh, to receive their sentence. God intended for government to, to determine whether a person is guilty or innocent or not and then quickly, quickly assign and accomplish uh, the punishment for the deed they've done. Romans 3 verse, uh, 13 verse 3 says, do you, do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good and, and you will have praise from the saint. God designed uh, government to punish evil, but understand he also designed government to reward those who are good citizens. We should not have to live in fear of the government. The government should be supporting its good citizens. The government should be rewarding us with peace, rewarding us with the ability to live a quiet life. We shouldn't have to live in turmoil all the time. 
the good citizens of the United States shouldn't have to live in a constant state of what's going to happen next? Who, who's going to be in the office there? Well, we shouldn't have to live with this anxiety and fear in our life. Government should be rewarding us as good citizens. Sometimes it doesn't. Paul's saying there, look, he's saying, if you don't want to have fear of law, don't break the law. Pretty simple statement. If you don't want to be in fear of, a, of the authority, then, then don't rebel against the authority. When I was a kid, there was a, a rock song that I remember had a line in it where the guy says, I fought the law and the law won. You don't want to fight the law. Because when you fight the law, you're fighting God. We as Christians, we want to do what's right. And we want our government to provide us with the peace and, and the life that will allow us uh, to, to live quiet lives and to go about business of God. That's one of the things we need to do. We need to make sure, regardless of what happens with the election this coming week, uh, that we have that kind of peace. That we still have the freedom to go out and tell people about Jesus Christ without worrying about government trying to close our mouths and close our thoughts and keep us from believing what we believe. For that reason, we need to pray. We need to pray, and we need to pray continuously for government. I don't think we do that nearly enough. We don't pray enough as a church. We don't pray enough as individuals for those that God has put in those positions for His purpose. Paul tells Timothy in 1 Timothy 2, verse 1, Therefore I exert, exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercession, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings, and for all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet, peaceful life in all godliness and reverence. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. We should be praying that we have such peace around us that our governmental officials allow us to live in such a quiet, peaceful life that we feel confident that we can go about evangelizing those who are lost and bringing them to saving faith in Jesus Christ without fear of being persecuted by our government for doing that. Paul tells a, another young pastor, a fellow by the name of Titus, in Titus 3, verse 1, he says, remind them, this is the verse that brought me to this message this morning, because this is exactly what I'm trying to do for you. Paul says, you know, if Paul was a, talking right in there to a pastor named Titus, a young guy that had been preaching to him in, in a very difficult place. He's saying, I need you, Titus, to remind them. And I want to remind you, he says, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. When this election is over, that's what we're to do. Obey the civil authority. Be ready for every good work. Speak evil of no one. Be peaceable, gentle, be humble to everyone. Good old southern boy terms, you watch your mouth, you be at peace, you be gentle, and you, you be humble. Like Jerry says, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect. <laughs> we are to be humble. Romans 3 verse 4 says, for he is, talking about the authority, he is God's minister for your good. Civil, civil authority is God's minister for our good. Whether, whether it's good government or, or bad government, God still uses government for our good. And anyone who rebels against the uh, government, anyone who rebels against the authorities, the law enforcement, the courts, uh, any part of government, local or, or state uh, government officials, when we rebel, we're rebelling against God. And we need to remember these things. Verse 4, Paul writes, But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister and avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. And, and I read that, man, those are, those are hard words. Those are stern. Paul says, look, if you rebel against the government, if you're a lawbreaker in any way, uh, God has given the sword to civil authority. God has given uh, the responsibility and the power 
to civil authority to suppress those who would rebel against it and to suppress those who would break the civil laws. Thought about that. Remember, Paul's writing to these Romans. Romans carried swords. What did they carry swords for? They carried swords to put down rebellions. They carry swords to kill people with. And Paul says, look, civil authority's been given a sword, uh, been given power to maintain the peace. So we, we need to be aware of that, and we don't want to be in violation of that. There was a time I remember when Peter, remember Peter, he was always getting himself in a mess, but there was a time when a, a large group came from, and they, they were mixed Roman soldiers and, and Jewish leaders that had come from the temple, and they came to the Garden of Gethsemane to arrest Jesus, remember? And, and Peter took out his little sword, and he decided he was going to fight back. He cut some guy named Malchus's ear off. And what did Jesus tell Peter? Matthew 62, verse 52, Jesus said to him, Put your sword in its place, for all who take up the sword will perish by the sword. We cannot rebel. If your candidate of choice doesn't win, you need to keep your sword in its place. Don't, don't whip it off and start beating people with it, verbally or physically. Now Paul he ends this section with one last comment, verse 5. It says, therefore you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. He's saying, look, so submit to authority not only because you fear the wrath of God and the punishment that might come from God because you've rebelled, rebelled against the authority He put in place, but also do it for your own sake to keep your conscience clear. Honor government, submit to government, unless they start commanding you to do something that is contrary to the will of God and be at peace. Now, that's what God calls us to do. I want to remind you as I close this morning of one final verse, maybe the most important verse that I'll read to you this morning. Matter of fact, I'm sure it's the most important, but Matthew 28, verse 18, Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. All authority. Regardless of who wins the presidential election in the United States of America this coming week, we need to remember that we have one king, that we have one authority, that we have one ruler that we serve. His name is Jesus Christ. And no matter what happens in American government, he's always going to be on the throne. We can put our trust in Jesus Christ. If you don't trust the government, if you don't, you know, I, I can understand that. But there's one authority you can always put your trust in, one authority you can always depend on, and he will always be on the throne, and his name is Jesus. We need to remember that, especially if things get a little dicey in the coming week, and I hope it doesn't. But it could. The potential is there. Just remember the things that Scripture has taught us as believers in Jesus Christ concerning our relationship with government. I'm going to close there this morning. I'll ask Faith, she'll come up and we'll have a closing song. We're going to be singing number 324 if you want to stand. Get ready for that. You don't mind that uh, slightly political sermon this morning. I was all prepared to uh, preach John to you this morning. He'd just keep going down the path, but uh, somehow it just seemed right in this moment to, to preach a little bit about uh, our relationship with our government. And I, I hope it was a benefit to you. Let's see. Yeah.
pray that uh, uh, we know that the election will come out whatever way you determine. Lord, that you'll, you're the one who places government and who, uh, who sets people in leadership. And Lord, whatever, whatever choice you make, Lord, as we uh, in agreement vote with you in regard to these choices, Lord, let us, uh, uh, let us be governed well. Lord, we pray that our government will be influenced, Lord, by our Christian vote. Lord, Christians should, in a democracy, influence the nation and influence the leadership. And Lord, I, it seems that as the number of Christians in this country diminish. The influence that the church has over government is also diminished. But Lord, we pray that uh, uh, regardless of what comes out of this election, that you'll allow us to live in peace. Lord, that you'll allow us to live quiet lives and that we'll have the freedom to continue to speak the name of Jesus Christ, that we'll have the, uh, the freedom still to worship you, Lord, to come together at church and to go out and evangelize those who are lost, Lord. We pray that you'll give us that peace. Lord, we do pray that our, our governmental officials now and those who are to come will, uh, will be under the influence of the Holy Spirit and do what's right. Lord, but even if they don't, we know that somehow you're using that for your glory and for our good. And Lord, we trust you, Lord, to, uh, to protect us, to take care of us, Lord. And we, do, we don't have to fear. We don't have to fear regardless of, of what happens with our government. We, we don't have to live in fear of the, <laughs> what's the worst thing that man can do to us. The worst thing you can do to us is take our lives. And, and even that's not bad because then we come into the presence of Christ. Lord, we need not fear. Lord, watch over us as a church, watch over us as a nation, watch over us as individual Christians, and let us live the life of Christ. Uh, let us be seen walking in it. Let our good citizenship be a, a part of our testimony. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.